That was sudden. Okay. Good morning. That's your cue to say good morning. Okay. It's an honor to welcome you to our 2022 commencement. I'm Lee Fisher, and I'm very grateful for the wonderful opportunity and honor to serve as Dean of Cleveland Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University. It just so happens that one of our graduates is a nationally known singer-songwriter. So we could not pass up the opportunity to ask Ashley Nema, who's graduating this year, to sing an opening song that we're all familiar with. Now, it just so happens that she woke up yesterday morning with an ear infection. So I said to her, you don't have to show up. She said, you asked me to do this, and I'm going to do it. So the bad news is that Ashley may not be able to hear what she sings today, but you will. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, singing America the Beautiful, Ashley Nemo. And that was with an ear infection. Unbelievable. Ashley, thank you very much. I've asked Ashley to sing another song at the end of our ceremony today. Please be seated, everyone. 2022 is our 125th anniversary as a law school for the oldest college at Cleveland State University. And thanks to so many, we are a law school on the rise in a university on the rise, in a city on the rise. I want to begin by thanking Cleveland State University President Laura Bloomberg, Ohio Supreme Court Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor, Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees Tim Cosgrove, and Provost Nigameth Streeter for being here today, as well as all of our other special platform guests who will be introduced during the course of our program. But first, I want to tell you something about this remarkable class of 2022. There are 148 of you, including our December graduates. You've come to us from more than 70 colleges and universities around the country and the world. 
133 of you are graduating with a Juris Doctor, JD degree, four with an LLM degree, and 11 with a Master of Legal Studies degree, and 13 with joint degrees. 69 of you are graduating with honors, 17 as summa cum laude, 31 as magna cum laude, 21 as cum laude. And the medallions that you are wearing reflect your academic accomplishments. Many of you helped publish one of the three outstanding journals, the Cleveland State Law Review, the Journal of Law and Health, and the Global Business Law Review. Others of you were involved in our national award-winning moot court program, our mock trial team, the Student Bar Association, the SBA, the Black Law Students Association, BALSA, or in one of our many other phenomenal student organizations and activities. And I want to pause for a moment to give a special shout out to the BALSA Thurgood Marshall Moot Court team, because for the fifth consecutive year, our team won the Thurgood Marshall Regional Midwest Competition. Wow. Some of you are wearing colored cords that reflect your involvement with certain student organizations and programs such as the Dean's Leadership Fellows Program. In addition to your academic achievements and those extracurricular activities, you donated thousands of honors, hours to pro bono activities and community service. But perhaps most importantly, you are the most resilient class to ever graduate from this law school the most. Early in the second semester of your first year of law school, the world turned upside down. The pandemic challenged the way we teach and the way you learn. You not only passed that test, you adapted and excelled. And I have no doubt that the unprecedented challenges that you faced will make you even better lawyers and even better leaders. Just as you have learned from us, so too have we learned from you. You've worked exceptionally hard like most people won't, so you can change the world in ways that most people can't. Today, you now become custodians of democracy. Today, you become guardians of justice. As you know, you would not have been able to reach this important milestone without the support of your family and friends who are up here today. While you studied and attended class, they supported you in many ways. And some of you, yes, they even changed their fair share of diapers. They also had to listen to you explain the rule against perpetuities or listen to you rehearse your moot court or mock trial arguments, and some of them may have even written some checks to help pay for tuition. <laughs> Amen, I heard that. <laughs> they deserve a large measure of credit for your success and many of the people in your support network. Your family and friends are here today to participate in the celebration, so I today want to now ask all our family and friends, everyone, to stand so we can show you our appreciation and give you a round of applause. Please stand. There's another group of folks here today who also deserve a lot of the credit for supporting your efforts and for helping you achieve your dreams. That group is our outstanding faculty. I want to thank the members of our faculty for your dedication to our mission, learn law, live justice. We appreciate your efforts in educating and inspiring our students and through your service to the law school and to the university, and that matter for the community as well. You serve as role models for all our students. I especially want to acknowledge our faculty members who are retiring at the end of this academic year. It's the most number of faculty that have ever retired in one year in our 125th history, so this will not be easy for us. 
Consecutively, they have taught a total of 309 years. So please join me in wishing the following faculty well on their retirement, although I put an asterisk by that, because many of them have agreed to have a reduced teaching load, but to continue still to teach as emeritus professors. Professor Michael Borden, Professor Patricia Falk, Professor David Forte, Professor Peter Garlock, Professor Deborah Geyer, Professor Sandra Kerber, Professor Ken Kowalski, and Professor Steve Lazarus, and four of them are with us today, and I'm going to ask them to stand. First, Professor Patty Falk. And please stay standing. Next, Professor Sandra Kerber. Please stand. Next, Professor David Forte. And Professor Steve Lazarus. Now let me ask all our faculty members who are here today to stand and be recognized. Please stand. I also want to recognize three of our staff who go by the title of assistant deans who are with us on stage today. Please stand as I read your name. Barbara Andelman, Assistant Dean for Admissions and Financial Aid. Sarah Beznoska, Assistant Dean for Student and Career Services. And Nicholas DeSantis, Assistant Dean for Student Success. He is a little popular, I know that. So thank you to all three of you for being here today. Now we also happen to have the single best law alumni association in the nation. Now every dean says that, right? But when I tell my fellow law deans around the country that we have an annual luncheon that attracts 1,000 people, in fact it's coming up on May 26, their jaws drop. The dean of Ohio State says to me, we don't even come close to that. That's the kind of alumni association we have. Now, why would alumni be so loyal and be so engaged? Why would so many of the judiciary here today who are graduates of our law school be here today? There's only one reason. You don't earn loyalty after graduation. You earn it while they're students. And because they love their experience as students at our law school, they've become the most engaged alumni association in the world. And today, we have the president and the president-elect. Allison Taller Reich serves as the president of our Alumni Association. She's a 2009 graduate and a partner at the Cleveland law firm of Franz Ward. Allison, would you please stand? And stay standing, you can stay standing. Robin Wilson serves as the president elect. She'll take office in June. Robin is a 1996 graduate and a partner at the Cleveland law firm of Olmer Byrne. Robin, would you please stand? And let's give her both a round of applause. We also have something called leaders in residence. These are extraordinary leaders in our community who do more than just come in a given occasional guest lecture. They actually have gone above and beyond and mentor and coach many of our students, as well as help me strategizing how best to run our law school. Each leader in residence volunteers their time, they don't get paid, and four of them are joining us here today. As I mention their name, I ask them to stand, but please hold your applause until I've introduced all of them. First, Judge Patricia Ann Blackman, class of 1975. I told you, hold the applause, ignore that, just applause, please. <laughs> I don't know why people say that, because no one listens anyway, so never hold your applause. Applause. Okay. Now, I have to tell you something about Patricia Ann Blackman. Please stay standing. She was the first black woman elected to a state court of appeals in the state of Ohio. After over 30 years of outstanding service, service she recently retired, but she has not slowed down. 
Last week, I was proud to announce the establishment of the Judge Ann Aldrich, Judge Patricia Ann Blackman Scholarship Fund. Now, why Judge Aldrich? Because she was the first woman federal judge in Ohio and was Judge Blackman's mentor and very close friend. Congratulations, Judge Patricia Ann Blackman. Next, Steve Percy, class of 1979. Steve, please stand. Where is he? Oh, Steve must be in the audience. So I forgot. Some of our leaders and residents are up there. So Steve, I can't see you, but stand. Steve is the former chairman and CEO of BP America. Next, Carter Strang, class of 1984. Please, Carter, also stand. Carter is a recently retired partner of the Cleveland law firm of Tucker Ellis. And finally, one who I know is on stage, Sonali Wilson. Now, Sonali, please stand. Even though Sonali is not a graduate of our law school, we actually think she is. Or at least we know she wished she'd gone to this law school. Not only is she a leader in residence, but she also serves as the general counsel of Cleveland State University and secretary to the CSU Board of Trustees. Please join me in congratulating these four leaders in residence. Also joining us today is our new interim provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Nigameth Streeter. Dr. Streeter just rejoined CSU just in the last few weeks after serving as the National Science Foundation, as pro at the National Science Foundation, as program director and the directorate for education and human resources. Provost Streeter, please rise so we can recognize you and thank you for your support of our law school. We also have a special guest today from the Cleveland State Univers University Board of Trustees. And I say special not just because he's the vice chair of the Board of Trustees, but because he's one of ours. He's a 19, 1987 graduate of our law school, and we could not be more proud that he is one of ours on our Board of Trustees, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Cosgrove. Now it's my honor to introduce the new president of Cleveland State University, Dr. Laura Bloomberg. Dr. Bloomberg was very recently named the eighth president of our university. She previously served as provost and senior vice president for academic affairs and before coming to Cleveland State, she served as dean of the Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. We're very fortunate to have President Bloomberg with us today and we've asked us to share, for her to share some remarks. Please give a warm welcome to our new president, Dr. Laura Bloomberg. Thank you, Dean Fisher, and thank you for your remarkable leadership of this remarkable school. Class of 2022, Hearty congratulations to you. We couldn't be more proud of your accomplishments. And I'd like to echo Dean Fisher's many thanks to the family members and friends here to celebrate with you. You've got a village surrounding you, and those people in your network of supporters who encourage you and give you strength are vital to your success. And I have to tell you on a personal note, I'm married to a lawyer. And I was a young spouse when he graduated law school, when he was sitting where you are now, not at this law school, but a different one. And I was up there where your family and friends are, and I had in one arm a 20-month-old baby, and the, on the other arm a two-month-old baby, um, who was spitting up with some prodigious level of capacity and the 20-month-old who had all kinds of opinions about where she wanted to be except for being on my lap. So when I hear the voices of little people in the stage, in the stands today, it fills me with joy. I want you to know that because it takes all kinds of family members and some of you might have your own children here in the audience today and I, it makes me think of being that young spouse and feeling so excited about my partner's future and so 
um, concerned about the noise. And I want you to know, if you're a parent up there with a little person, bring it on. It's a joyful noise. This happens to be a particularly special commencement ceremony. As the dean said, this college celebrates its 125th anniversary. Since its founding in 1897, this school has been notable for being the first law school in the state to enroll women, as well as one of the first nationally to admit minority students. And today, graduates, you will join the legacy of this college's alumni that includes dedicated lawyers and judges, legislators, several Cleveland mayors, Ohio Supreme Court justices, and dozens and dozens of alums who have formed the civic fabric of this community and communities nationally. You will have your village, you will have your alums, and I too, along with the Dean, also want to take this moment to recognize the remarkable Law College faculty who have guided you on this journey as your teachers, your mentors, your allies and advocates, and sometimes as the people who were simply there to provide much needed encouragement or that not so gentle prod when you needed it most. You have thanked these faculty members, but I too want to join you in thanking them for all of the, what they've done. So I was planning to talk with you today about persevering through a global pandemic and encouraging you to be lifelong learners. Those were some messages that I conveyed at our university-wide commencement ceremonies yesterday. And then I got home from commencement last night and I learned for the first time of the horrific hate crime perpetrated on innocent lives in Buffalo, New York. 13 people shot, 11 of them black, 10 of them now dead. These innocent lives were cut short by an 18-year-old young man who identified himself online and in writing as a white supremacist who traveled miles to this largely black, peaceful community in Buffalo and opened fire in the parking lot of a grocery store. Now I realize this is not an uplifting image to share with you on your commencement day. But here's the key message I would like to share as I think about what happened yesterday and as I reflect on it. The Cleveland Marshall College of Law logo says this, learn law, live justice. Learn is an action verb so is live. They look good on a logo. It is when you embed this vision, these actions into your future, that you will change the world for the better. Learn law, live justice. Today in a little bit, you are so fortunate to hear from Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor, who is herself a Cleveland Marshall College of Law alum and who will deliver your commencement address. I do not know what the Chief Justice is going to say today, but I do know this. When I read about the Chief Justice on the Ohio Supreme Court website, it says this about her. Chief Justice O'Connor has pursued an extensive agenda for strengthening the third branch of Ohio government in a number of areas, first among them is racial fairness. Learn law, live justice indeed.
Graduates, regardless of whether your chosen career path leads you into the judicial branch of government, into criminal law or corporate law, tax law, health care, government, or nonprofit leadership, I urge you on this day of new beginnings for you to remember the action verbs in the mantra of this, your soon-to-be alma mater, learn law, live justice. As a leader yesterday said to our graduating uh, classes during commencement exercises, you don't need it to be easy. We don't, we don't need it to be easy. We just need it to be possible. Congratulations, graduates. President Bloomberg, thank you. And thank you for reminding us that we're all fortunate to be alive at this moment, especially in the context of the tragedy of yesterday. Each year, the Student Bar Association chooses a faculty member and a staff member of the year. This year, the SBA chose two faculty members of the year, Professor Carol Hayward and Professor Steve Lazarus. Professor Kel Hayward is a graduate of our law school. She teaches a variety of popular courses, including the transactional law clinics, negotiation courses, and contracts. And students give Professor Hayward high praise for her ability to provide feedback that is both constructive and encouraging. No student leaves Professor Hayward's class without improving her or his skills in some tangible way. And Professor Steve Lazarus, as I mentioned earlier, is one of our retiring faculty members, and he will be deeply missed. Although he, too, will continue teaching with a few less courses, the most important thing to say about him is that he is a legendary professor here at our law school. He is beloved for his dedication to his students, and as one student said, he truly is an amazing professor who always goes above and beyond for his students. He has high expectations of us and ensures that we are fully prepared to meet those expectations. Now, we're also honoring today a staff member as well, Jamie Gay. Jamie is our Assistant Director for Student and Career Services. She's twice been chosen Staff Member of the Year, even though she just joined us a few years ago. She focuses on student advising and career goals, academic planning, and wellness. As one of today's graduates shared, she's a true champion for students, and her passion for helping us achieve our goals shines through in everything she does. I want to ask Professor Carol Hayward, Professor Steve Lazarus, and Jamie Gay to stand and please step forward to the podium so I can give you your awards. Please welcome them. One more award before we hear from three of our extraordinary students. In addition to our distinguished full-time faculty, we are fortunate to have an exceptional team of adjunct faculty members, a number of whom are here today in the audience out there and, all, and one who's on stage. Now, I want to first ask all those adjunct faculty members who are here today to stand. And if you're up there, please stand. If you're here, Leo, please stand. All of you, please stand so we can thank you for your work. They make it possible for us to offer an even broader array of advanced and specialty courses. To honor this group, retired Ohio Court of Appeals Judge Richard M. Marcus, who until this year always graced the stage at our commencement, himself an adjunct professor, provided a gift to fund the annual Richard M. Marcus Adjunct Faculty Award. Sadly, just weeks after he was inducted in our Hall of Fame, Judge Marcus passed away but his legacy lives on. I'm pleased to announce that this year's recipient of the award is Joseph P. Dunson. 
Now, Professor Dunson teaches the legal profession course which prepares our students for what's called the MPRE, the Multi-State Professional Responsibility Exam, and students rave about him and regularly applaud him for using real-world examples and hypotheticals after each new rule. Unfortunately, Professor Dunson came down with COVID just in the last 48 hours and could not be with us, but let's give him a round of applause. I also want to recognize today our 2020 recipient who we didn't get a chance to publicly recognize, and that's why he's with us here today. So Theoph Theophilus Hudson, or as we know him and call him Theo, is on stage today. He not only teaches banking regulation, but he also teaches appellate advocacy through his work with our Thurgood Marshall Moot Court team. Theo was a member of that team as a student, and his team was regional champion and placed fourth nationally. In the last six years, he has coached teams to two national championships and a regional championship five consecutive times. I ask Theo Hudson to please step forward so we can acknowledge and congratulate him with this award. Now we have the opportunity to hear from three of our exceptional student leaders. It's become a tradition at our commencement to hear from the president of the Student Bar Association, the valedictorian, and the winner of the Dean's Live Law, I'm sorry, Learn Law, Live Justice Award. Devonna Mason is the president of the Student Bar Association. In addition to serving as SBA president, she also served earlier as president of BALSA and was awarded just this year at the BALSA banquet Outstanding Upperclassman Award. Now please join me in congratulating Devana for leadership and inviting her to say a few words. Devana Mason. Hello everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Devana A. Mason, the proud daughter of DG Mason and I'm honored to speak before you today. As I prepared for this speech before you, I wanted to focus this message on encouragement and gratitude. To encourage you all, I'd like to begin with a brief story about little Devana and how she came before you today. In the seventh grade, I was riding the school bus home. On this bus, there were a number of rules and one of them was no gum. One of my classmates managed to sneak a piece, but she grew tired of it and threw it out of the door where the driver saw. He was not happy. The young lady blamed it on another student and each of them faced suspension if no one came clean. A day passed and the driver asked again. The culprit did not come clean and I just couldn't take it anymore. I stood up loud and proud, finger pointed out and told the truth. It was very, you can't handle the truth. Now, before you all call me a snitch, hear me out. I'm sure these two could have figured it out without my help. But at the moment, I was compelled to stand up for my peer who I thought was being wrong and possibly missed school for misunderstanding. This was the moment I decided to be a lawyer. I wanted to help people. My interests and reasons for law school have since matured and carried me to this moment before you. From a silly story of my childhood, I would like to encourage my classmates to advocate with passion. Speak up for yourself and others loud and proud because you are your best asset. This degree will carry us far and I implore you to use it wisely for the good of our community, our family, friends, and yourself. We have to find the good and go do it. Leave a meaningful mark on this world and let's be remembered for what we gave. I'm proud to stand before such a powerful group of people. I'm grateful for the study sessions, the shared notes, the outlines, the laughs, and the tears. You all know. The moments in our lives where we've shown up for one another outside of school. I encourage you to remember what you are made of as you face your next challenge. Whether it be for the bar, a job, 
a personal or professional experience, we survived three years of reshaping our thinking, our writing, our communication, and our ability to believe in ourselves. Two and a half of those years, we were confined to our homes because of the pandemic. We lost family, jobs, income, friends, experiences, and more. Yet, we persisted. We can do anything. Now for the gratitude. To the supporters of law students, without you, we are nothing. <laughs> My circle was that good. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with us when we could only express frustration with this process. Supporting and loving a law student is not easy, ask my mom. To all the mothers, especially Mommy Wami, and those that have passed on, thank you for the prayers, the patience, the encouragement. To the fathers here and that have passed on, thank you for your wisdom and grounded guidance. To the siblings, thank you for seeing us, uplifting us, cheering for us and keeping us humble. To the grandparents here and that have passed on, thank you for inspiring us, for being our reason to fight so hard for this degree and our future. To the aunts and uncles and those too awesome to fit in any box, thank you for the time, the interventions and the outpouring of love. To the besties, thank you for keeping us sane. Thank you for buying us meals. Thank you for unconditional support and laughter. To the spouses, thank you for your unconditional love, reminding us we are not failing ourselves or our family, but contributing to our family's dreams. To the educators, thank you for leading us through this journey, reaching us through tears, doubt, and frustration, for teaching us how to run the marathon. To the mentors, thank you for growth, sponsorship, career opportunities, and motivation. Thank you for bringing this degree to life for us by showing us how far we could go. Law school was a journey like none other, and I am elated to put it behind me. <laughs> but I am forever indebted to this experience for all it gave me. Law school was a worthy sacrifice and it made room for so much more. I'm proud of you all and I am honored to be your colleague and friend. Thank you. Thank you, Devana. Lucille Richmond is our valedictorian with the top grade point average at the end of the fall 2021 semester. Lucy served as an academic excellent program fellow, AEP as we call it, for contracts, a peer tutor, and an academic support coach, helping her fellow students succeed and providing a support system throughout these past three challenging years. Please join me in congratulating Lucy on this well-deserved honor and inviting her to say a few words. Lucy Richmond. Good afternoon. I think Devana summed up all the thank yous more beautifully than I could hope to. So I just want to reiterate, thank you all, especially my mom and dad and Eric. None of this would have been possible without everyone here. When Dean Fisher asked me to speak today, I was at a loss for quite a while on what to talk about. There's so much I could say about the last three years, but as I'm sure a lot of my classmates would agree, it's hard to put it into coherent words. We've heard a lot about the pandemic um, for the past few years, but I will say this. I don't think law school ever would have been what we expected, but our three years were really not what we expected. One positive that came out of all of it is that we proved that there's more than one way to learn law. Some of us, myself included, 
learns that we thrive in an in-person, interactive classroom setting, but we also had a chance to discover that some of us learn better asynchronously, or perhaps at home, or in a park, on a beach, or anywhere else. So knowing that, I thought if there's more than one way to learn law, there has to be, in line with our school's motto, more than one way to live justice. So I looked up some definitions. There's a lot of different conceptions of justice out there. So a few examples, equality and equity, the legal system a country uses in order to deal with people who break the law, a judge, and my personal favorite, seeking what is right for yourself and those around you. Some of us may go on to become judges or to practice civil rights law, or hopefully for all of us, to incorporate pro bono work into our practices. But living justice should not be limited to our legal work. Having a law degree gives us a powerful tool to live justice, but it doesn't mean that we can't live justice outside of the law. We will all wind up living justice in our own ways, and I'd like to tell you about my grandma Ellen, who is a great example of how to live justice in the law and beyond. So this goes for everyone, not just my classmates. After raising three kids and being a teacher, in her late 40s, my grandma decided to go to law school, and she came here to Cleveland Marshall. After graduating, grandma went on to practice estate planning for over a decade. She worked toward justice for her clients by making sure they knew their loved ones would be taken care of. A while after she and my grandpa retired, they decided to focus on grandma's other passion, chocolate. They started their own business, giving chocolate-themed tours of Naples, Florida. Everyone deserves to find joy in their lives. So when we pursue our passions, whether chocolate or anything else, we live justice for ourselves. Then a few years ago, my grandpa became sick, and grandma became his caregiver, coordinating therapies, taking care of their house, and helping grandpa with the day-to-day -day things that he couldn't do on his own anymore. She showed me during those years what it can look like to live justice for our loved ones. My grandma is a lawyer, but she has shown me that living justice goes far beyond that. It isn't limited to practicing law, and you don't even need a law degree to do it. We all do it, often unconsciously, when we take care of ourselves and our loved ones and advocate for what we believe in. This will continue after school, whether we continue in law or not. So going on this summer, we will continue to support one another and commiserate through bar study and hopefully celebrate together afterwards. Down the line, we'll all find our own ways to live justice in our lives, but I hope that that continues to include each other, helping each other find jobs, giving advice, and celebrating our wins. So to all of you, at the very least, I expect to see you at Becky's when our bar results come out. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you, Lucy. Each year we recognize a graduating student whose law school career has exemplified our law school mission that you've already heard a lot about today, Learn Law, Live Justice. A student who has demonstrated selflessness and care for her, his or her classmates, respect for the faculty and staff and perseverance, and who shows promise for embracing his or her new law degree as a force for good. This, this year there were 12 outstanding, and I mean outstanding, nominees. But one student, Taylor Gill, stood out for her outstanding leadership in many areas, especially as a leader on our Racial Justice Task Force. Please join me in congratulating Taylor Gill on this well-deserved award and inviting her to share a few words. Taylor Gill. Thank you, Dean Fisher, and thank you all for allowing me the chance to speak this afternoon. To start, let's give a round of applause to our amazing graduates. I think we can all agree that the last three to four years have been a bit stressful and chaotic. Approximately 993 days ago, we embarked on the journey that is law school. About 20 weeks after that, once we finally have found our footing, boom. COVID-19 took the world by storm. Classes, studying, job interviews, and even happy hours all became Zoom meetings. 
Students, faculty, and staff struggled to adjust on the fly. None of us were prepared, and some of us were even scared. To make matters worse, in May of 2020, George Floyd was murdered by a police officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. This was a heart-wrenching loss for the black community. As a black woman, I had to not only grieve this unnecessary loss, but also process its disparaging implications. Between the COVID-related changes and cancellations and the chronic mistreatment of marginalized people in this country, I felt like my world was falling apart. Imagine being engulfed by a fire fueled by grief, stress, anger, anxiety, and depression. That's how I felt, and I didn't know what to do. I remember calling Nick DeSantis, wave, <laughs> and sharing my woes with him. While very respectful and of my emotional process, he encouraged me to use my voice and be the change that this country so desperately needed. This struck a chord with me and inspired my diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at our law school, as well as my speech here this afternoon. The fire that burns inside you shines brighter than the fire that burns around you. And I'm gonna say that again. The fire that burns inside you shines brighter than the fire that burns around you. Just think about it. Jim Crow laws were no match for the passion and grit of civil rights activists. The grueling questions from U.S. Senators did not stand a chance against the intelligence and grace of the Honorable Ketanji Brown Jackson. And COVID-19, the biggest fire of them all, was outmatched by the hard work and determination of the Juris Doctors before me today. So, my fellow graduates, as we embark on our next journey, whether it be as an attorney or otherwise, do not let anyone or anything take your fire away, not even yourself. Be the change amongst the stagnant, be the voice amongst the voiceless, and be the dissatisfied amongst the complacent. Never stop feeling your fire. As I close, I want to thank a few, few special people this afternoon. To my classmates, thank you for your amazing camaraderie and support over the last three years. To the faculty and staff, thank you for always putting us first and making sure our needs were always met. To my dearest friends and mentors, thank you for cheering me on every step of the way. Your encouragement and affirmation have been invaluable. To my mom, dad, big brother, and immediate family, thank you for your unconditional love, support, wisdom, and guidance. I would not be the woman I am today if it weren't for you. And lastly, to Nick DeSantis, thank you for always believing in me and showing me the strength and power of my fire. It shall continue to blaze on for years to come. Thank you. Hey, Devana and Lucy, come back up here for a second. I want to give each of you an award, which I was supposed to give to you each when you came up individually, but I'm making it up as I go, so I'm doing it right now. Let's go here to get a picture, and this is uh, first to Devana, to Lucy, and to Taylor, and please get a photo right here. I'll, I'll come up close. Photo opportunity. Thank you to each of you. Before I introduce our commencement speaker, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the presence of a very special group of alumni. They wear robes all the time, not just at a commencement. Throughout our history, our law school has played an important role in educating future judges. That includes a number of you, my, my best guess. Today, we are proud that more of our graduates sit on the state and federal bench in Ohio than any other law school by far. In fact, three of the seven justices on the Ohio Supreme Court are our alumni. Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor, Justice Michael P. Donnelly, and Justice Melody Stewart. Today, we're honored that a delegation of distinguished alumni judges has taken time out of their busy schedules to join us today. And I want to ask each judge, as I mentioned them by name, to stand. And I'm ignoring what it says here. Hold your applause. Do not hold your applause. First, 
the Honorable William O'Neill, retired judge of the Ohio Supreme Court. The Administrative Judge of the 8th District Court of Appeals of Ohio, the Honorable Sean Gallagher. Another judge in the 8th District Court of Appeals for Ohio, the Honorable Eileen A. Gallagher. And of course, I want her to stand again, recently retired judge from the 8th District Court of Appeals, Judge Patricia Ann Blackman. And we have a number of judges today from our Court of Common Pleas here in Cuyahoga County. First, Judge Cassandra Collier Williams. Now remember, each of these judges is a graduate of our law school. Next, Judge John J. Russo. Judge Shirley Strickland Saffold. <laughs> Judge Andrew J. Santoli. <laughs> Judge Deborah H. Turner. <laughs> Judge C. Ellen Conley, recently retired from the Municipal Court. And up there somewhere, the magistrate, Joanna Lopez Inman. Magistrate. <laughs> We're honored by your presence today. Thank you. Our commencement speaker today is the Ohio Supreme Court Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor, a 1980 graduate of our law school and the 10th Chief Justice of the House Supreme Court and the first woman to lead the Ohio Judicial Branch. Her distinguished career in public service and the law includes service as a private lawyer, magistrate, common pleas court, county prosecutor, and the most important statewide office, Ohio Lieutenant Governor. Chief Justice O'Connor is past president of the National Conference of Chief Justices, and former chair of the National Center for State Courts Board of Directors. She was inducted in the Cleveland Marshall Hall of Fame in our inaugural class in 2017, and she serves on our Board of Visitors. On a personal note, I've known her for more than 24 years, and we share a birthday. Same day, same year, but she is much, much younger than me. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues from the bench. Thank you. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dean Fisher, for that introduction. You're right. We have known each other for many years. Uh, we have figured out, though, that you were born earlier on August 7th, and I was born in the afternoon, so actually you are older than I am. <laughs> President Bloomberg, Provost Sridhar, former Justice O'Neill, judges, law school faculty, distinguished guests, friends, and family, and the Cleveland Marshall College of Law class of 2022. It is a high honor to serve as your commencement speaker today on the 125th anniversary of the College of Law. I am honored to be among you and the distinguished alumni. I know many of you are feeling excitement and nervousness. You are at the very beginning of your career, extremely lucky to be where you are and to be entering the professional world armed with a law degree. Be you are lucky to be where you are because of the, the nature of the practice of law, the nature of justice within the practice of law. Because of the changing dynamic of the practice of law in Ohio, 
and around the country, and because of the opportunities for change in our system of jurisprudence, your future is unlimited. You are poised for success in so many ways. I would love to be where you are knowing what I know. But today, I'm in a different place in my professional timeline. The Ohio Constitution is telling me it's time to do something new. So at the end of the year, I will step down as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio. But before I do, I want to share the benefit of my experiences as you excitingly head into your professional life. Some of you will practice law in the traditional sense, that is representing clients, individuals, and businesses. Others will use their law degree to teach, to work in-house for corporations or nonprofits, to work as a public servant, to become entrepreneurs, and the possibilities are limited only by your imagination. Whichever path you take, remember what Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. You might think that that's easy for him to have said that. He was the President of the United States. He could create anything he wanted to. But he was not President when he said that. He was a young person, a young person who was smart and a hard worker. He was persistent. He experienced failure and rejection, and yet he held on to his dreams. So, create your future. It's up to you to find a niche that suits your talents and your interests. Experts tell us that chances are you will change places and types of work four or five times during your career. That is exciting. Far from causing trepidation for graduates, this fact should be liberating. I know, because that's my story. There is a myriad of options to use your law degree to reinvent the practice of law. Do not be locked into the traditional join a firm and stay 40-year model, because that model may, never, may no longer exist. Whichever way you go, my experience has reinforced what you already know. Do your very best, and opportunities will present themselves. I started out in the practice by hanging out a shingle and taking criminal appointments representing small businesses in the community and by taking probate cases. And I loved trial work. It was interesting and stimulating, and I had success at it. Judges appointed me to all kinds of interesting cases. I was trying cases. Clients referred other clients. I was on a path. When you work hard and you do your best, you will have success and you will also become noticed. In Summit County, where I practiced, there was an opening for a magistrate on probate court. I had handled cases in probate court and I guess impressed a long-serving magistrate there. I was asked to consider becoming a magistrate. Now, that was not part of my plan. I was gonna be a trial lawyer. But when I was asked to apply, I thought about it. I had a husband, two young children, I always like to say that I failed to attend my graduation. I had a child the next day, so I was busy doing other things. They had to mail the uh, diploma to me. I would have preferred they mailed the baby and I attended law. <laughs> Didn't work that way. Anyway, I had a husband, two young children, law school debt, and while it did not pay much, I think $26,000 at the time, that was a lot back in 1985. The benefits were good, and as we weighed it, it was a good move for my family. That was the beginning of my career in public service, and it has been 37 years since that decision. Obviously, I had a few intervening jobs from probate magistrate to chief justice. It was not a straight path. But my point is, when you do your best, you are noticed and opportunities present themselves. But here's the advice. Most people think that identifying a goal and making a plan to reach that goal is all there is in your choice of a career. The flaw in that approach is while trying to go from point A to point Z, wearing blinders, you'll miss great opportunities along the way. Your career, like mine, could involve some very interesting twists and turns. 
Don't miss them. The best part of life happens in those interesting twists and turns. Working on the probate court, I became interested in local politics. I got politically involved. I watched the common pleas judges and thought, I can do that. And becoming a common pleas judge was then my goal. Making decisions purposely, as I said, I became active in politics, helping my boss, who was the probate judge, when he ran and running myself a few times without success. But that was okay, because I was paying my dues. I knew that there were several judgeships that would be opening up soon due to retirements. I knew the governor makes the appointments. I knew that the local party put forth names to the, of the preferred candidates. The local party rec recommended me and Governor Voinovich appointed me. Later, I was elected to the common pleas bench with 70% of the vote. I attribute that to doing my very best, which earned me a reputation for solving problems both big and small, for treating litigants, for treating attorneys with everyone who came into the court with respect. I advise you to build your very best reputation you possibly can and to guard that reputation. Show people and your colleagues that you are humble and kind. You work hard. Be an example of fairness, integrity, and civility. Be an example of that every day in all that you do. While law school will soon be in your past, remember that learning is not. You will be amazed at all the things you have to learn. Keep learning, never stop. Some of you may be uh, Masterpiece Theater fans. It's a show on PBS that's brought to us by Viking Cruises. Viking chairman Thorstein Hagen grew up in a small Norwegian village. He talks about the values instilled by his parents, kindness, honesty, and hard work. Just what I've talked about. And then he adds a fourth, and that is to be curious. Be curious about the law, but so much more. When I mentioned to a friend of mine, Judge Brendan Sheehan, presiding and administrative judge in Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas, that I was speaking to the new graduates of our alma mater, he asked me to mention the advice that he received right out of law school. Read something other than briefs, treatises, opinions, and journals. Read for pleasure. Read several times a week, at least for pleasure. It will keep you entertained, thinking, and doing something interesting to you besides the law. It helps to satisfy your curiosity about life. Now, do not worry if you have not secured that dream job yet, and that's okay. Don't be discouraged. Use this time as a gift. This could be an opportunity for you to provide public service and sharpen your skills at the same time. Once you pass the bar and are admitted to the practice, think pro bono. Countless Ohioans and fellow Americans are disadvantaged and need legal advice. You can use your growing wisdom and expertise to help them. Think about it this way. Helping others will bear your confidence in applying the law and advocating for clients. Your local bar can connect you with opportunities for pro bono in your community. Pro bono work goes hand in hand with the privilege of practicing law because it can change lives. If you wait to take on pro bono work, you may never get around to it. And there are too many people in need. So start now and build a habit of pro bono for your entire career. Remember, to whom much is given, much is expected. Please exceed those expectations. I went from being a judge to being the Summit County prosecuting attorney. Admittedly, it often happens the other way around. But remember, be open to opportunities. When the longtime prosecutor in Summit County was elected to be a Ninth District Court of Appeals judge, I saw an opportunity to go do good things and to serve, to serve my community in a different way. Service has been constant in my career plan. I left my judgeship to become the county prosecutor. I never expected to do that. I thought I'd be a common pleas judge for the rest of my career. But the prosecutor opportunity presented itself, and I was uniquely qualified to fill that opening. 
While doing my best and having developed a good statewide reputation as the Summit County Prosecuting Attorney, I was approached by Bob Taft, the Secretary of State, who was running for governor. He asked me to be his running mate, the Lieutenant Governor. I never expected or planned to do any such thing. But I said yes, and we were elected. Here's the advice I'm trying to get across. Be ready to take advantage of what presents itself. Chances are it won't be anything on your radar, but, but just may turn out to be the perfect fit. When a position needs to be filled, whether in politics or private sector or any other area, if you work hard, if you are standing, uh, are you outstanding and are willing to take a risk, you'll be surprised what will come your way. But I must caution you about risk. If you cannot handle the risk, don't take a risky path. If you will be devastated by a loss in the political arena, don't run for office. If you're going to be devastated by loss in a courtroom, don't become a litigator. There are so many other options. Know what is best for you. Follow your plan. You do not have to take every good opportunity that comes along, of course. You may not be ready or it's not right for you. Don't do anything because others say you should, but in your heart, you know that it's not right. There will be other opportunities. But I can tell you that stepping just a bit outside of my comfort zone led to some of the most valuable experiences in my life. So know your own risk tolerance, but don't be afraid to stretch. I've always wanted to see what's around the next corner. I'm curious. During that stretch and throughout my career, I have met a wide range of smart and interesting people who have continued in my life. One of them is your dean. Lee Fisher and I were on opposite sides of that gubernatorial race I mentioned a moment ago. Yes, two smart people in different political parties. While we had philosophical differences on some issues, I respect him as someone with a lot of talent who committed to serve others and did a lot of good for the state of Ohio and continues to serve today in remarkable ways. Thank you, Dean. As you grow your network in the legal community and in life, do not look for the differences you have with others. Look for the common ground and the ways you can admire your adversaries. Because a courtroom battle should not be a fight to the death. The law should prevail. And in the future, you may find yourself on the same side of a different issue or case, and you want to be able to work well along all kinds of capable people it will make you stronger. What starts as good manners and civility can lead to friendship. So your last, your last law school les lesson from me, let it be that civility must prevail. And civility in the law was the theme echoed recently by a juror in what has been characterized as one of the largest murder cases in state history. It was a case where the defendant was acquitted. It was a physician in Columbus who was accused of killing patients by use of fentanyl. He was acquitted. The juror afterwards, said, one of the jurors afterwards said, and I quote, the fact that we were going to have strong opinions was going to be undoubtedly true. It was paramount that we all walked out after having very intense debates and arguments and disagreements, but we never lost the first rule which was to respect each other, and that really helped hold us together. Now, the last thing I want to emphasize with you is that you use your law degree and law license to help your fellow human beings. In 2008, J.K. Rawlings addressed the graduating class of Harvard University. Her words resonated with me, and I hope that they do with you as I close. Quote, if you choose to use your status and influence to raise your voice on behalf of those who have no voice, if you choose to identify not only with the powerful, but with the powerless, if you retain the ability to imagine yourself into the lives of those who do not have your advantages, 
then it will not only be your proud families who celebrate your existence, but thousands and millions of people whose reality you have helped change. We do not need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside of ourselves already. We have the power to imagine better. Thank you and God bless. Yeah, not good, good. Chief Justice O'Connor, we not only want to thank you today for being our commencement speaker, but for your outstanding service as Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court. Please accept this award on our behalf and token of our appreciation. Thank you. I want to share one additional item about Chief Justice O'Connor. I'm pleased to announce that upon her retirement at the end of this year, she's agreed to join our law school as a distinguished jurist in residence. Thank you. We're very honored and thank you again for your exceptional service as Chief Justice. I'm very fortunate to have two extraordinary associate deans who helped me lead our law school to fulfill our mission. So I'd like to ask Associate Dean Carolyn Broing Jacobs and Associate Dean Jonathan Rich to please stand so we can thank you for your leadership. And I'd like you to stay standing because we're now at the point where we're gonna give out some diplomas. Our associate deans will call the names of our graduates, and professors Carol Hayward and Stephen Lazarus will guide our graduates onto the stage. So if you would now go down there. And I want to acknowledge that Assistant Dean Sarah Beznaska will assist me and President Bloomberg in presenting the diplomas. So now I think we play pomp and circumstance. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct privilege to present to you the Cleveland State University, Cleveland Marshall College of Law graduating class of 2022. Sham Ben Musa. Teresa Johnny. Hilda Yanko. Rohel Bluma Adler. Margaret Trace Ahern. Rachel Nada Al Alami Hannah Rebecca Albion, Magna Cum Laude.
Reese Albright. Nathan Allstadt, summa cum laude. Chupuka Dwight Aaron Anyafo. Rachel Denvia Bustler, magna cum laude. Carly Elizabeth Caldron, magna cum laude. Patrick Carl Carabin. Brendan James Carney, magna cum laude. Rachel George Shahood. Tokunbo Fashanu. Justin Anger. Michael Donna. Michael on 
Aniceto Di Domenico, summa cum laude. Monica Dever, cum laude. Dever, cum laude. Anna Maria de Garmo, magna cum laude. McKenna P. Doss, cum laude. Marissa Lachey Cooper, cum laude. Joseph Connick, magna cum laude. Gianna Marie Colucci, magna cum laude. Lydia Marie Fauzi, magna cum laude. Lyle Fenton, summa cum laude. James Flanagan, cum laude. Joshua Friedman, cum laude. Erica Nicole Gandhi. Rachel Martha Ann Garcia. Aaron Gabatz, summa cum laude. Caitlin George. Anthony Gazul, summa cum laude. Yvette 
Gomez. Carolina Gonzalez. Matthew R. Goodman. Jillian Lucy Gasser, cum laude. Nicholas Gulish, cum laude. Peter E. Hanna, cum laude. Naivasha Harris. Nathan Hill, summa cum laude. Haley Hillsman, magna cum laude. Zachary Hofstetter, magna cum laude. Kelsey Renee Holmberg, magna cum laude. Elizabeth Houston. Patricia Claire Huntley. Noel Hutner, Magna Cum Laude. Anna Maria Jadu. Diane Carol James. Brittany Nicole Kosmarczyk, magna cum laude.
Kathleen Meredith Kennedy. Haley Christine Kepchar, cum laude. Megan Kirvin. Owen Knapp, cum laude. Chase Samuel Canoto. Dylan Adam Colby, cum laude. Kevin George Kozak, magna cum laude. Bennett. Elmer Kuhar, summa cum laude. Ryan Kuhn, magna cum laude. Haley Joan Leary. Carmen Mann. Marchica. Devana Adriana Mason. Isabella McKnight, summa cum laude. Samantha Monroe. Ashley Navy.
Victor Nero, magna cum laude. Maxim Chidiego Wabra. Melissa Suzanne Obadzinski, magna cum laude. Antonia Obeche. Ryan Mark Palco. Gabrielle M. Poplis, Magna Cum Laude. Tina Ramashvili. Jamie Razor. John Reddy. Jeremy Ribondo. Summa cum laude. Joseph Ranella, Magna Cum Laude. Chloe Lynn Robinson. Gabriella Russo. Shenley, Magna Cum Laude. Taryn Lewis Schoenfeld, Summa Cum Laude. Shaheed, Magna Cum Laude.
Jacob Siegfried, magna cum laude. Bianca Nicole Claire Smith, cum laude. Talia Eden Stewart, cum laude. Emily Laura Sturkel, magna cum laude. Ryan Strollo. Matthew Francis Savancara. Javon Thompson. Michael Watkins. Claire Priscilla Wizoric, magna cum laude. Adam 
Callum Williams. Aaron M. Witherspoon, Jr. Mary Margaret Wood, cum laude. Chance Zura. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct privilege to present to you the CSU Cleveland Marshall College of Law graduating class of 2022. Please stand. You can sit just for a moment, we're almost done. Now, anything is possible for each of you. As you know, as Lucy mentioned, the how bar exam is next. It's in July, less than 10 weeks away. You and those who love and support you, who have been cheering today, you need to understand something that the best way you can show them your love is to let them study. <laughs> because believe it or not, it's even more time consuming on a daily basis than law school. They'll probably be spending eight to 10 hours a day, in fact, many of them already are, preparing for this exam. And I ask all of you, although I think I know you already do, take it seriously. Because if you do this, I have no doubt you're going to be successful and anything will be possible. 
Please remember that we're your law school for life. Today is not goodbye. It's always hello. Our Office of Student and Career Services, led by Assistant Dean Sarah Beznoska, remains available to you every day for the rest of your career, not just now. So if you have questions, if you want advice, contact Sarah and Jamie, and stay in touch with us, please. You've learned law. Now lead and live justice. Devana said it very well. Leave a meaningful mark. Lucy said it very well. Find your own way to live justice in your life. And Taylor said it well. Never, never lose your fire. Anything, and I mean anything, is now possible for each of you. And I now invite back to the podium singer-songwriter Ashley Nema, one of our graduates this year, to share with us a song that she not only will sing, but that she wrote. Ashley Nema. Thank you, Ashley. Please remain in your seats until the platform party and the graduating class of 2022 leave. I want to thank Jill Natron and Holly Goodman and the many other members of our law school staff who've worked so hard to make this day special today. You're all invited to a reception right back there on the floor of the Wolstein Center immediately after we have concluded our ceremony and the ushers will assist you in getting to the reception. And before we do, again, class, stand up again, and another round of applause for these phenomenal 2002 graduates. Thank you, everybody.